what's the word y'all it's been a minute since we've done like a real traditional ramble and you know what it, it was the genesis of this channel and i'm just i'm just gonna do it the idea is to just talk basketball for however many minutes and try to not cut anything the only problem is i be losing train of thought so yeah this pr will probably be edited and it kind of defeats the purpose but i want to remind people if you, oh, well maybe you knew around here these ramble videos basically have no structure i have a few topics that i want to talk about but these are just what goes on in my mind as an nba fan and 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 whatever um I, I know i shouldn't be uploading this on sunday because it's football's day it's but but i can't get i can't do the football thing anymore ladies and gentlemen this was supposed to be the year where i cared about football and for the first couple weeks i did we did fantasy fantasy football put some money in on it and uh, my, my team was not good and who would have thought that not watching football for five seasons then immediately jumping into a, a money pool fantasy football tournament wouldn't be a good idea i did it anyway and um some people might brandon cooks have you played at all this season? like it's a, it's some people on my team i'm like damn what is anyway um sunday's supposed to be for football but as an enjoyer of basketball and it being my full-time job i can't help but to talk and think basketball um the first team i want to talk about is the minnesota timberwolves i don't know what their record is it ain't good um and uh, it's, it's unfortunate if you've been around for at least a month you may have seen a video of me trying to predict the western conference standings for this upcoming season i said in that video something along the lines of uh the minnesota Timberwolves are going to win a ton of regular season games because they are built that way uh and through three weeks how that that's the l take uh that's what these ramble videos are by the way it's it's me a microphone a camera and lukewarm takes that usually turn out to be pretty bad um my idea behind the minnesota Timberwolves kind of made sense in the moment it was rudy gobert is damn good and carries defensive teams defensively and anthony edwards in the playoffs looked amazing and Carnegie towns was really good too so that right there should be a formula to win at least a good regular season games and then once we got to the playoffs i mean we still have rudy gobert as our back line d defense so we'll see exactly what that looks like but i thought in the regular season they was gonna be fine and peachy but i underestimated um how long it would take for things to jail because here we are three weeks into the basketball season and they ain't jailed a little bit like I've, I've watched every if maybe not every game but majority great majority of the games this season and guess what they had one fun moment not one i'm not even and i'm not even exaggerating the, the the best they've looked was last night or two nights ago against the memphis grizzlies and that's a, that's a game they lost ladies and gentlemen and they didn't even have fun doing it you remember when when Carthen towns was going against the lakers and he was mic'd up this is towards the end of the season he's saying 10 toes down we here or do you remember the celebration of making the winning the goddamn play in you remember how happy Anthony Edwards was all season long when he dunked on Yuta Watanabe, when he sent his step back threes making people fall? He's, he was a guy that enjoyed it. He smiled regularly, pretty regularly. I, I legitimately cannot account a time he smiled this season. I can't. I can't account a time where Carl Anthony Towns was trash talk. I could count him fouling a hell of a, a lot, but I can't account him trash talking and having a bunch of fun. Rudy Gobert has always been a pretty stoic player on the court, so I guess that is still the same. But the joy of this roster has completely gone away, which, which sucks. Because last year, especially towards the second half of the season, they were one of the most enjoyable teams in basketball. You ain't really know what you was going to get. You got V8 in the dunker spot. You got Patrick Beverly running around and fooling people, apparently. And then Carnegie Towns have a great moments. And then we get to the playoffs, and Anthony Edwards looked like he hit another step. And then the offseason comes around. And, of course, the, the biggest trade of the offseason possibly – going down is the biggest trade i don't know that let me stop talking in extremes because off the top of my head i this probably I, I don't know there's probably more trades but the rudy gobert trade happened and uh even in the moment even with me believing that the minnesota Timberwolves will win a bunch of regular season games in the moment go back and watch my video if you don't if you want receipts i said that was an overpay i didn't understand who they were going against why did you have to give up this many first round picks plus all the rotational players i didn't understand it but in the moment i was like i don't understand it but i could see a path of this being good underestimated how bad Carthage towns will be on the perimeter guarding force i underestimated how long it would take for them to jail on the offensive side of the ball and i overrated d'angelo russell's ability um to play a high pick and roll um so th there's a lot of things that I, <laughs> that I was wrong about a lot of things i was wrong about but even in the moment i was thinking to myself uh this is this is definitely an overpay and that is coming from maybe the biggest rudy gobert fan on the platform my boy TTW Clips put together a video. 
That, that, that's the reason why I'm doing this video, by the way, because I it made me think, and I was just I, I thought it was extremely funny. TTW Clips is a channel that watches every episode of my podcast with me and the homies and just finds funny moments and stuff, memes and whatever. There's a video he dropped today that was called um, Kenny being a Rudy Gobert fan for 38 minutes. It is a 38 minute video of me arguing with my co-host about how good Rudy Gobert is compared to general consensus. Uh, and, and, and you want to know the super crazy part about all of that? He could have added another 38 minutes on top of that. I am about to add more minutes to that conversation uh, because I, I tweeted that. I tweeted a screenshot from that video. I was like, I'll, I'll do it again. Um, and the comment section under that, um, to nobody's surprise, was like, people were genuinely asking me, Kenny, why are you such a Rudy Gobert fan considering, you know, how he performs, yada, yada, yada. And some people think that Rudy Gobert is, is a net negative um to ross to the roster right now and i that for me that cannot be the further from the truth i've been the guy that have defended rudy gobert but i'm not an ass so i'm not a jackass i can i can look at the deficiencies of him um in the clippers game in the in the second round in the playoffs a couple years ago where the clippers went small and he had no no bag I'm not a bad guy, but he had no way to take advantage of him being guarded by Terrence Mann. Or when we got to FIBA basketball, um, or Eurobasket, sorry, I don't know which one it is. Uh, and they were going against Germany, and he was guarded by Dennis Schroeder, and Dennis Schroeder locked him up. Like, he, for, for somebody that's been in the league as long as he has, you would expect him to develop one go-to move, when in reality, the go-to move is dunk the ball. And he's been good at that. Four years before this one, he led the league in dunks. But other than that, he just doesn't space the floor obviously with his lack of jump shooting but he does provide a lot on the offensive side of the ball and what you would want from a guy of his size is to be able to take advantage of mismatches and he wasn't able to i accidentally hit the stop recording button thank god i realized that um he hasn't he has not in the life for the life of him been able to take advantage of mismatches and um that has hurt them come playoff time for sure like i'm, I'm not gonna be a jackass about it but i am a firm believer that when it comes to protecting the basket there's nobody in basketball that's as good as him and has not been anybody in basketball as good as him over the last five years. The numbers say it. The eye test say it. That people do not go to the basket and Rudy Gobert is on the court. And when they do, they get stopped. This is actually the lowest deterrence rate of his last five. I'm just going to keep saying five years. I, I don't know the exact number. Of the last five years or so, this is his lowest deterrence rate, which means that people are challenging him more at the basket this year than any other season. But guess what? Them of us, they, they still not finishing at the rim. They're attempting it. They're still not doing it. So I, I've understood how bad he can be offensively, but I just look at that defense and the paint being, of course, the easiest place to score in and be like, he prevents people from doing that. So I am a fan of that thing. So that is my reasoning um, for kind of jumping on this video because that, that is my belief. And, and I've been seeing people blame Rudy Gobert for the lack of success through the first couple weeks in the season and again everybody deserves their own blame because he's a part of the team and not only is he a part of it he's a guy that that is a, is an all-star caliber player and they basically they have two all-star caliber players and one guy that, that people project to be there or wanted him to be there this season and they've been extremely underperforming but i i want to try to put this out there y'all tell me if i'm bugging of course it's always a conversation I think we should, and not just in the case of not just in the case of Rudy Gobert, but in the, in the case of pretty much every trade, in my opinion, we should be able to separate the player that was traded versus the trade. And here's what I mean by that: Rudy Gobert this season has been doing exactly what Rudy Gobert has done for the last X amount of seasons. There's there's been no progression, no regression with Rudy Gobert's play. He is doing the exact same thing, right? So I can't, in my mind, and you, again, tell me if I'm bugging, say that he himself is the reason for the lack of success if he's doing exactly what you thought he was going to do and exactly what you traded for. Now, when I say you separate the trade from the player, this is what I mean. When you when you got to look at what you gave up versus that, I can completely understand. You can say that the team's lack of success is because they gave up all of the depth to get Rudy. I understand that part, but saying that Rudy Gobert is the reason when he's doing literally exactly what you expected of him, is it, 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 it doesn't really compute. Now, I can understand you saying like, hey, 
because Rudy Gobert is on the Rudy Gobert is on the floor, the offense has suffered, and that is that has been the case. When Carl Anthony Towns and Rudy Gobert are on the court together, the offense is god awful. When Carl Anthony Towns is on the court by himself with no Rudy Gobert, the offense has been great, but the defense has been one of the worst in basketball. When Rudy Gobert has been on the court, the offense has been dreadful, but the defense has been one of the best in basketball. So like when they're on the court together, they cannot coexist, and when they're on the court without each other, the thing that they're lacking is a big like it's a big hole there. So I can't say oh Rudy Gobert the Rudy Go Rudy Gobert is the reason for his lack of success but i can say tim Connolly and the rudy gobert trade played a big part in this not necessarily the player and i think i would say this for i don't know a lot of different trades um i mean i don't know some a lot of these other trades that happened this offseason have somewhat been successful the atlanta hawks have been hit or miss but uh above 500 team uh, the Cleveland Cavaliers have been really good, even though they're currently on a losing streak. I think they go against Minnesota tonight, so that's going to be a really, really solid game. But I, I want to go down their big four, the, the fantastic four, and, and talk about what they are doing that is bad for the organization slash team. Starting off with D'Angelo Russell. I thought that when the Rudy Gobert trade happened, and, and I'm a guy that does not do X and O's. I don't understand it. It is a level above my knowledge and a level above my IQ. So if you put me in a room with a head coach, 100% of the time that head coach is, is the smartest man in the room. Just It's not it's not even close. That that man got the IQ of $6 billion and I'm sitting in the corner with a three. You know what I'm saying? So in my mind, pairing Rudy Gobert and D'Angelo Russell on the court together, no cat, uh, maybe D'Angelo Russell, whatever, or maybe uh, Anthony Edwards, whatever. I just thought that a high pick and roll D'Angelo Russell and Rudy Gobert will be elite. Because in my mind, the best moments I've seen of D'Angelo Russell is when he had an elite level role, man. And Rudy Gobert is still an elite level role, man, this season. Um, so I thought that, hey, he's got another one. He ain't had one since he got to Minnesota. Boom, here's the moments. Ain't really been the case. D'Angelo Russell um, has not been able to shoot the ball. And even Chris Finch is talking about, oh, it's maybe lack of, um, what did you say, lack of confidence and things like that, which is something you never want to hear. Because once we start getting to the mental aspect of basketball, it's it's hard to to fix. Is really based on the player and getting out of their own slumps. But his lack of shooting and his lack of, I can't say lack of playmaking, but I'm just, I'm just going to say that just because I'm dumb and can't think of any other way to word it. His lack of playmaking has been a detriment to this team. Moving on to Anthony Edwards. Those plays, or the play, I, I mean, I can't even, I can't even pluralize it, but like the play that went viral of him sitting on the wing with his hands on his shoulders and Tari Eason is guarding, literally face guarding, which is funny, um, and him not doing anything but just watching the play develop on the opposite side of the court is is terrible and i think that a lot of young players in basketball it takes them a while to kind of understand what the hell to do when they don't have the ball um and i think it will come around for anthony Edwards because he's a really really talented basketball player but stuff like that obviously doesn't help um he has not taken that step that a lot of people expected him to take remember before the season started when anthony Edwards was the odds on favorite in vegas to win most improved player the guy that was drafted first overall two seasons ago, y'all went to Vegas and put money on that man who already averaged 22 points per game to win most improved player. You had a better chance of giving that money to me and me turning that into more money opposed to just donating it to Vegas. I don't even know how that was even a thing. That was pre-Rudy Gobert trade and post-Rudy Gobert trade. People was like, oh, Anthony Harris is going to take that super jump. And, I'm not, and, and I understand the idea of him taking a jump because – he was damn good come playoff time but taking a most improved player jump is i don't know what the hell y'all was thinking um but he hasn't taken that jump that a lot of people expected him to take and i'm not even just talking about the scoring department i'm also talking about his playmaking kind of a disappointing in his the way he's been reading the floor so far this season um and he, I mean, it's not like he was ever chris paul or anything but I always look at a guy like Anthony Edwards, who is so talented on offense, and think that, hey, we know he can score. We know he can get to the basket at will a lot of cases. We know a step-back jump is looking nice. But, like, in order to put it all together on the offense side of the ball, he has to make the people around him a threat. Because if you can make the people around you a threat while also being extremely lethal, you are unfuckwittable. The, the best example of this is Luka right now. We gonna, I think we're talking about Luka maybe a little bit later. It's like Luka is such a good playmaker 
that he's he's making Dorfinney Smith in, in a, like a real threat, which means that oh we got to guard DFS, which means that Luca got more matchups for himself. Like so, Anthony Edwards hasn't taken a next step um, as a playmaker. Carthony Towns has been a cone um, on the defensive side of the ball, uh, keeping up a force a lot harder than I thought it was going to be for him. A lot harder than I thought it was going to be. Uh, maybe it's the size 22 sneakers that he's playing in. Or maybe it is the fact that he came into camp or after camp, really late to camp, because he was sick and lost X amount of pounds and yada, yada, yada. But Carthony Towns is such a infuriating player to watch. Um, I, I will say I have enjoyed the efforts he's made on the playmaking tip to try to make it work with him and Rudy Gobert. Like, through the first couple games of the season, I was like, oh, snap, they doing, like, high-low uh, actions. He's ducking it down to Rudy Gobert, who's, who's sealing off a player. Oh, snap, he's I think he's averaging a career high in assists this season. So that's been fun. But the reason he is infuriating is because his body language has to be bottom three in basketball. Where when things are not going good for him personally or for the team, you can see it, and you can't tell me as a guy that has looked to be the leader, because that's that's what he, he's trying to be. When he comes to the podium and say, hey, I need Anthony Edwards to stop eating goddamn Popeyes, he's trying to be a vocal leader and the leaker leader in the locker room. If my leader is going back on defense with his head down and his shoulder slump, how do you think that make me feel as his teammate? His body language is bad. His, 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 his I don't know, he's a, he's a flailer, as in like, I do believe that he he should be getting more calls. There's a lot of times where he does get hit, and I'm like, damn, where, where, there was a lot of contact, ref. But I think because he doesn't get those calls, he's trying to embellish these interactions, and it makes him looks like look like more of a fool because, bro, you 6'11 with a size 22 on your feet. Like, it's no way you can flop or, or make a foul look little, more like a foul without you looking weird. And then the last thing, he cannot stop fouling. And I think part of that is because, like I mentioned, he's a cone, and I mean, he's, I mean, I guess he's trying his hardest to do. It's, it's been bad. Over the last couple of seasons, he's ended up bottom, top five, bottom. I'm, I'm saying this bottom five because this is a negative statistic. He's bottom five in fouls per game, and I think over the last, last week, he's fouled out twice or so. That's unacceptable. For a guy that's supposed to be the best player, the building block of this team, the one of the most impactful players in the organization, it is completely, completely unacceptable. And Rudy Gobert, I think I already mentioned a lot of his deficiencies, even with Carthony Towns um, and him on the court, he has been negative spacing, like like po not posting up, but standing on the same side as Carthony Towns. I don't know if that's a Chris Finch thing, but I'm, gonna, I'm just going to put that in Rudy Gobert because Chris Finch showed us last season his offense is pretty damn good. So I can't say he's telling Rudy to stand on the same side as Carthony Towns for plays at a time. You know, I can't, I can't do it. Offensively, he has been hurting the lineup. I mean, you know, off numbers and stuff say that. So everybody has had their own little thing to prevent this, this team from being nearly as good. But we didn't, even all that said, I still want to give him more time before I start thinking about People saying this is all people are already saying this is the worst trade of all time. And I can understand why it looks like that right now. And I'm not saying it won't end up being the worst trade of all time, but it's still too damn early for me to say that. But if you do go to Tankathon right now and you look at the lottery odds, um, the Jazz have a chance to get a Victor Women Yama while also being towards the top of their conference right now. Because that first pick is this year's pick and it is unprotected. But I also think I think they gave up a pick that is 2029 unprotected. Holy, f bro, that is such crazy. You know those look really good right now? Walker Kessler as a backup center has been damn good. Um, uh, yeah, T Tim Connolly's a crazy mofo, ain't he? He's a crazy mofo. And the 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 craziest thing about it is like hypothetically this don't this don't work out two years down the line. Tim Connolly might get fired, but like, so, you know what I'm saying? If he gets fired, he doesn't have to live with the consequences of setting the organization back seven years, setting an organization that has been bad for 20 years. Remember that back another seven. He will He will never. If this turns out to this is what we need to do. We need to start adding this to uh, GM's contracts. If you if you blow a trade so bad. And again, this still has a lot of potential to be solid. But I'm thinking about the Billy King, Danny Ain't. Danny Ain't's been finessing people for a long time. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I don't <laughs> I don't really mess with Danny Ains, because he won't pull off a trade unless he's absolutely certain that he is the winner of this trade. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Um, but like you need jail time. Simple as that. You need jail time. 
If you set if you set an organization back half a decade, you need jail time. Uh, <laughs> no, that's that's extreme. But you get what I'm saying. Tip Connolly, if he gets canned in two years, he's got two years salary that he just made up. Then they give him partial equity in the in the the team. Isn't Tim Connolly like a part owner of the of the I gotta move on, bro. That's that a lot of Minnesota Timberwolves talk. Jeez, jeez, jeez. Um, the Pelicans have been interesting. They almost lost a game to the Houston Rockets today. Uh, shout out to Jose Alvarado because legitimately he put his backpack on um, and won them this game with a couple clutch threes and then some some steals that led some emotions uh, from Kevin Porter Jr. or whatever. But I continuously watch this, this team this season. And last season when they traded for CJ McCollum, it was a match made in heaven. They needed another spark, somebody that could come in and score the ball. And this is the first time we have seen CJ in like a full point guard role. And he was doing a damn good job at it. I watched this game and I think he ended up with like seven or six or so. I, I I think they need a real playmaker. I don't know who that is. I don't know how they even accumulate that, especially when they traded for CJ, extended CJ. They extended this uh, Larry Nance Jr. They extended a lot of people already. But when I watched them play, I, I think that uh, there's no such thing really as a traditional point guard. I, Chris Paul has become a traditional point. I know I, I, I'm kidding. I always got to talk about Chris Paul. Chris Paul has become a traditional point guard, like a legitimate traditional point guard now because his ass can't score anymore. He He's just playmaking. That's about as traditional as it gets. Um, and I don't know where you find traditional PG or anything or how you do such a thing but like i watched this team play and the fact that zion shoots i think eight shots today or nine shots today and he was damn efficient in those and i think to myself how how are we not getting him the ball he ended up with 26 points on nine shots he had 12 free throw attempts it was amazing it was a good game from zion seven assists from cj but i feel like he almost shot them out of, well he kind of did shoot them out of this game and i also think about their defense and zion um, I already said that Carl Anthony Towns has been a cone Zion to the third degree. I mean, Z Zion doesn't defend a goddamn thing. I forget what game it was. It might have been against the Portland Trailblazers. It might have been Jeremy Grant tearing this boy up. And, and teams, whether we get to the playoffs or whatever it may be, right now they have two players in their starting lineup that if I'm Luka or if I'm Trey Young or if I'm another uh, great Western Conference guard, that's great in isolation. I'm like, Zion, whoever's guarding Zion, come set me a screen. Whoever's guarding Val, come set me a screen because those are two dudes in open space. I feel my chances of scoring is super, super duper high. I ain't got no numbers to back this up. I test why Zion is like maybe bottom five in the league defensively, which is crazy because I genuinely remember his days at Duke. Um, and yeah, you had the highlight plays of him jumping out the gym to block the shot into the third row. We don't get no blocks like that no more, by the way. Um, and and things like that. But he, he wasn't this bad of a defender. He was not this bad of a defender. And I understand he's coming back from some major stuff. But even pre-major stuff, his defense was a lot to be desired. So I can't look at Herb and Brandon Ingram's length and be like, oh, we're going to be able to defend whatever in the playoff time. Because uh, it's just it's just not, re it's not really the case, man. Not really the case. Um, the next thing. Um, there's a tweet uh, from a, a prominent NBA Twitter account that was uh, tweeted a, a video of the Memphis Grizzlies. The Memphis Grizzlies won a game against the Minnesota Timberwolves, and they were on half court doing a post game interview, dancing, doing Minnesota, t nope, doing Memphis Grizzlies stuff, stuff they've done for the last three seasons. And the caption is always the same with these: "It's like, oh, I can't wait for somebody to humble this team." Um, and I just maybe I'm an old head at this point in time, I guess, because. I look at the Memphis Grizzlies and them enjoying wins and being like, that's what I would want. If, if my favorite team was winning games at the clip that they're winning and, and as fun, don't forget that. They're winning games, but it ain't like they, I don't know, the Spurs of old. No disrespect to the Spurs. We got love for the Spurs right here. But this is legit. They're legitimately one of the most fun teams of basketball. They're a young team with some great personalities, some great basketball, and they, they have fun when they have a random player like uh, Dylan Brooks score off for 12 points in the first quarter, and at the end of the game, he's still hot. They interject on each other's interviews and stuff. That looks like good chemistry, good team stuff, and the idea of them needing to be humbled is kind of wild to me because at the end of the day, they're just enjoying their jobs. You know? I don't see it as unprofessional. I think that that word in itself is problematic as hell especially when we're talking about the game of bat the game of basketball you remember when they told Allen Iverson he can't wear jerseys anymore and he needed to wear a suit because he was being unprofessional like let these boys hoop and let these boys dance let them do their thing you know what I'm saying 
need to be humbled. I mean, honest, if you want to see them as a villain, go ahead. You could do that. But I do believe you're missing out on some great ass basketball if you hate watching. Because John Moran is crazy. Um, and you know what? I saw an article. Uh, yeah, this, see, this is what the rim was. I saw an article talking about John ja Morant's time management um, and, and how, more than any other player in basketball right now, how he's he's got the refs by the collar. And they linked to a video of in this game. It was fourth quarter. It was nine minutes, seven seconds left on the clock. The Timberwolves just score, but the ball kind of goes... It wasn't like a quick pickup inbound. The ball goes underneath and kind of around. And instead of Ja Morant or whatever player jogging to get the ball or getting it back and play fast, they walked. And the clock went from like one, uh, 9.06 to 8.50 because it was a running clock at that point. So they, they ran off 16-ish seconds of basketball that the Minnesota Timberwolves could have used to come back in this game. They weren't going to come back in this game. We just talked about all the inefficiencies and the, ba the bad things about the team. They weren't going to come back. But like... How, if that was going to be the case for almost any other team, it's a delay of game. But with the Memphis Grizzlies slash John Morant, it wasn't. I was like, oh, okay, let me start Let me start looking out for this a little bit more. A little bit more. Maybe there's something to it. Maybe there's something to it. Maybe there's not. Uh, next thing on the list that I want to talk about was the Brooklyn Nets. Yes. Um, KD and the kids is what I always call it. Even though, again, it's not like they out here running with just a bunch of young dudes. They do have a few. Um, but it's not really kids. Because let me, let me look at this box score right now. Royce O'Neal vet, Joe Harris vet, Seth Curry vet, Patty Mills vet. That's four of their top eight players have been in the league for like a billion, a billion years. But I call it KD and the kids because alliteration is fun to me. And I'm a, I am personally a kid and I like alliteration. But also it feels like KD doing it himself, if you want to say that. Um, since the, 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 the dilemma, the dilemma of this conversation is, is it Kyrie that's out there or is it because Steve Nash got fired? Because this streak that they own, this elite level defense and good offense streak that they own right now coincides with both of them. <laughs> and I, in, in due time, because eventually Kyrie Irving will come back, whether that's in a week or a month or however long it takes for Joe side to reinstate that man, eventually he will come back. So let me, let me look at the numbers right here. Let me look at the numbers live on the show. In the last two weeks. The Brooklyn Nets are 5-2. and two. Pretty damn good. They have the highest point differential in basketball with a plus 13.4. They have the 12th best offense and the number one ranked defense in that time frame by a wide-ass margin. Number two for reference is the uh, Milwaukee Bucks at a 106. And the Brooklyn Nets are at a 100. Six whole points better than the number two defensive team in the last two weeks. Um, so I, 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 and a lot of people are trying to figure out, is that a Nash thing? Is that a Kyrie thing? I think my initial thing is say that was a, that's a Nash thing. Um, because Kyrie Irving is not the difference between a very bad defense and the best defense in basketball. Uh, Kyrie's not a good defender. Don't get me wrong, but it's his, his, um, presence isn't from 25th in basketball to number one. Like when Kyrie's on the bench, I, I'm assuming for a good portion of his career, the team has got better defensively, but not not this much better. So I'm gonna assume this is a Jacques Vaughn and a post firing boost, because by a lot of reports, Steve Nash was calling out plays in his last game as the Brooklyn Nets head coach, and they weren't listening. And I guess they they respect Jacques Vaughn, who's just again one of the most fun names to say. Uh, they were talking about his beard on the broadcast today. They showed a picture of him in the bubble. Yeah, he just had a goatee, and now he got this big bushy beard with a little bit of with a little bit of white down there. Shout out to Jacques Vaughn. Um, but it seems like they're listening to Jacques, and it's been. So, I made a tweet about this. It's been so good. They've been so good that nobody cares that Ben Simmons played 14 minutes, had four fouls, and hit a shot. Nobody cares anymore. They have a max contract. They have two max contracts. Not playing. They have one, and operational organizational disciplinary action and the other one don't play and they're like oh we good bro we good because seth curry starting to hit his shots again and uh, kevin durant is just really ridiculous especially when you start looking at what these opposing teams are doing to try to prevent kevin from being kevin a lot of the times they're sending two to three different bodies at him there's a legit times where i was watching this clippers game and there was three people running at kevin and they found out a way they found out a way. 
Um, so I'm, I'm really, really intrigued now because now they're starting to look like a cohesive basketball unit. And I wonder if that changes once Reed comes back. Because uh, right now they decided against more bad uh, publicity and not how they didn't hire Ime and let Jacques Vaughn do his thing for the rest of the season. And I'm guess I, I don't know, but I'm guessing post Kyrie coming back, all of the scandals are behind them. But it is the Brooklyn Nets. So that might be cap. I mean, they could just go out. They could just go out there. Who Edmund Sumner? Um, when he's finally been on the court, he's been a revela revelation. Yuta has been injured. He was really good for them this season. But like Ben Simmons, I said I said in my tweet that Ben Simmons is like the I think ninth best player on the roster. I was giving him just a little bit more love than maybe I should have because a lot of these people are out there right now hooping. They're just they're just they're just hooping. So we'll see what happens with the Brooklyn Nets when Kyrie comes back. They said it was supposed to be a five game, but I think he's going into game number six. And Joe Sy said he's not ready yet. So we'll see. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about, and this is not an idea, this is an idea that I want to spend more time on, but I kind of want to put it on y'all plate um, as of right now. And it has to do, it has to do with player development. And the reason this is on my mind right now is because the other day I was watching the Spurs play and I made a tweet that was like Charles Bassey in his NBA minutes has looked pretty good. And that's been the case. I mean, Charles Bassey, coming from the 76ers, has been really good. And this morning, I woke up to a tweet from the San Antonio Spurs that says, Charles Bassey is the second player in NBA history to, to have 14 rebounds, four blocks, four assists, and less than 20 minutes played, and the first player in the league in the history to do that off the bench. Pretty good in, in a pretty small sample size. So I tweeted Charles Bassey has been good because, again, that's what he has been. And there were a lot of 76ers fans saying that, hey, somebody has to pay. <laughs> somebody has to pay for this. Uh, and a lot of people are blaming Doc. This makes sense. Doc doesn't like to play young players. But a lot of people are blaming it on the lack of talent development across the league. And, and like in some organizations – are damn good at it. They pride themselves on whether it be a late first round pick, second round pick, undrafted players, putting them in the best position to become the best version of themselves. And people are arguing that the 76ers are not one of them organizations. Think about the process. Think about everything post-process. How many of their draft picks have we seen under the, t the t tutelage of the 76ers hit peaks? And people start throwing out examples like Jeremy Grant was there. He didn't really do anything until he left. Robert Covington was there. He played some of his best basketball post that. Um, and just so, so on and so forth. Somebody gave like a whole list. And not all of them do I think are like, yeah, that's a great example. Because like some players, you know, this goes back to the Bulls as well. Um, some teams give up on players so early that like them hitting that next step 100% should be about the team that they went to once that helped them develop that. But also it's like, damn. He was only 22 when Team A gave up on him and only two years of basketball under his belt. Like, we could have saw that he was going to get better. You know what I'm saying? Um, so, it just had me thinking, like, what are some of the best development teams in basketball versus the opposite, the opposite point? And then it got to my Chicago Bulls. It's like, we had this player, this player, this player, this player. And the Bulls, they've had a lot of players. Larry Marketing being the prime example, the one that owns top of everybody's head right now. Or Wendell Carter who's been pretty solid um, post-trade to the Orlando Magic, where the player will leave the organization and glow up. Or a player that we used a pretty high draft pick on fizzles out of the league because we didn't develop them the right way. And, I mean, for every three bad examples, it feels like there's one really good example um, of the opposite. But but it's just, it's just something interesting that I'm, I'm thinking about doing for a bunch of different organizations and trying to figure out like who has the best player development um i can think of a few off top just based on what i've seen in the last couple seasons but i think i want to dive in just a little bit more um so that's my ramble uh enjoy some football or don't i'm team don't so yeah 